We're at the end of week four here in financial foundations class. We've got three people huddled in the dark here so they can see the screen in my classroom and a few online, so that's good. And a good chunk of today is just gonna be spent figuring out where the gaps are and what we remember. Because um, there's a document that I just posted. Let me pull that up real quick. I just posted this particular document Unit one test prep. Um, you can use it to take notes on if you want to. Generally speaking, this, you know, remember the way this course is broken down is we got four weeks of sort of the big picture economic stuff. So that's what this test is about. Then we'll have another four week segment on uh, personal financial planning and different issues related to that. Um, and a test on that at the end of the four weeks. And then there's our final. So the tests are gonna make up 80% of your grade. Final is 10%. So try to do well on these, these big tests. You know, we got, got one every four weeks. It's not a lot, but if you've been doing the, if you've been working on the handouts and working through the materials, you should be fine. So the first thing I want to start off with, though, is a little bit about, you know, our, our main our main topic this first four weeks is all the stuff related to economics. And we've talked some about democracy and capitalism as a part of that. Uh, I did not watch it last night, but I, I saw some news reports about the president's speech last night is. Joe Biden's first hundred days in office, and he he's uh, suggesting that our democracy is recovering. And so this is a this is a really important time to live in America, um, for that matter, to be a global citizen, because there's a lot of stuff going on um, all around the world with social issues, um, even some political situations where an ethnic group, ethnic groups are, are being treated very poorly. So the, the fact that our democracy allows us to vote for our elected officials is kind of unique in a lot of ways because most or a lot of countries in the world, a lot of citizens of other countries don't have that right. They don't have that opportunity. So if you think about democracy as a political system, if you're asked about the definition, you got to say something about voting because that's really the key element for a democracy. We get to vote. We get to elect our officials to represent us. Capitalism, and I saw, I've seen a lot of good definitions that you guys have been writing on this stuff. Capitalism is all about making money. Profit is the bottom line. And the what's being produced, how it's produced, where it's being produced, uh, that's all relative to private ownership, individuals, Corporations can own all that stuff. It's not controlled by the government. It's not controlled by the state, so to speak. And there's regulations, of course, but capitalism is about making a profit and private ownership of the means for production. So what happens when you get these forces to combine like they have in the United States. Well, if you remember us talking about um, 
gross domestic product, GDP. I'm gonna show you a graph here that's it's a it's a it'll be a graph in motion that'll tell you or show you how various countries have done as far as the 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 dollar amounts of their gross domestic product starting in 1980. Most of you probably weren't around in 1980. Um, I had just finished college in 1980. So <laughs> these years here, these last, well, the 43 years on this graphic are the bulk of my adult life. You guys are just getting started. So how can they have 2022 and 2023 on this? It's 2021. Those years haven't even occurred yet. Projections. Yeah, exactly. They're projecting. They're they're taking trends. I mean, that's what economists do. You know, you, you make a sort of prediction that, you know, things are going in a particular direction. You know, if that trend has been going on for say 10, 20 years, there's a pretty good chance it's going to continue to go in that same direction. So um, they they make projections and crunch the numbers and come up with some of these things. USA at the top, Japan, Germany, Italy. There's China down in the middle. China's gone past the United Kingdom in 1980, 80, late 1980s. Japan is still second, Germany third. Now China's up to fourth. Oh, Russia out of nowhere. It's like a horse race. the stretch they come. So look at the top three here. From 1980 to 1997, China went from down here in this area all the way up to third. India kind of followed them up the rankings here a little bit. These, these heavily populated countries that can produce a lot of stuff. Um, they have a lot of manufacturing. How come, why is Japan up here so high? What's, what's Japan's big industries? Is it oil? Sony? In general, what does Sony represent though? Gotta plug everything in. Electronics, technology, right, good. Electronic technology, uh, gosh. And, and they're, they're designing it, they're making it. Some of it's getting farmed out. The second biggest one, I think, is still automotive for Japan. They make a lot of cars, they sell a lot of cars. Yeah, Mitsubishi, Nissan, uh, Subaru Azuzu. I mean, the, the list goes on. So those top two have stayed pretty consistent here. The first 17 years that this graph is, is unfolded.
Okay, 2013, that's only eight years ago. China and USA virtually neck and neck. And if you saw how fast that red bar was growing over the previous 10 years for China, it was, it was we as a country were not growing nearly as fast as in terms of what we produce. And if you remember back to that Milton Friedman uh, video where he was talking about trade and he mentioned the tigers of East Asia and the, the, his, his, that video was recorded from an interview in like 1994 or something like that. So 20 years later, look who's in the top 10 here in gross domestic product, China, India, Japan, Indonesia, Indonesia is making all kinds of stuff now because labor is cheap. Clothing. clothing, yeah. Huge clothing producers, right? So in the top 10, you've got one, two, three. I, I count India even as, as part of that Tigers of East Asia grouping, especially nowadays. Although India is really struggling right now with the coronavirus. So here's where we are today, 41 years from the time that this graph started. China's uh, GDP is over $30 trillion. The US is over 22 trillion. India, over 12 trillion. Japan, Germany, Russia, still pretty significant gross domestic product. If you think about Japan's gross domestic product, Japan as a, as a country in production has always amazed me because it's an island nation. They got, they've got densely populated areas. They don't have a lot of natural resources. Anything that they make, they are basically importing the natural resources to produce it. And back in the 1980s, when the yen was, so, was trading so favorably to the dollar, that's when they started looking to build their plants in America because they could make the manufacturing cheaper and be closer to the natural resources. Anything else that anybody see on, on this chart that is, is interesting or surprising to you? USA, China, USA, India, third, Japan, Germany is the black bar, uh, then Russia, Indonesia, Brazil, United Kingdom, and France. I think that France is probably the 10th. Yeah, France is 10th. Why, why do economists look at this, this kind of comparison, gross domestic product? Why would they track this over all these years? Yeah. If, if like Friedman said, we're, we're not doing as well as we could be doing, this is one way that we could kind of measure that. You know, other countries are growing a lot faster than we are. Maybe there's something else that we need to be doing in order to increase our production or to increase the value of the things that we are producing. And 
you know, economists love numbers. So some interesting stuff here. We'll go ahead and finish this out, see what their projections are for the next two years. So it says Indonesia in 2023 is expected to overtake Russia as the sixth largest economy in terms of GDP. Indonesia is a tiny little country. It's an, isn't it also an island nation? I believe it is. So they are going like gangbusters right now to produce stuff that is highly valuable and is traded all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. So next time you go buy some clothes, check the tags, see, just out of curiosity, see where it's made. That's, that's as far as I know, I mean, I don't know if they're involved in any kind of heavy industry or big production of vehicles or anything like that, but I think it's mostly clothes and shoes. Okay, because they can use a lot of man-made stuff for to produce those. Doesn't always have to be cotton. Right, could be nylon, could be polyester, could be plastics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. So we, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about gross domestic product, but I wanted to be sure that we looked at that graphic because it does kind of tie um, all these things together. And in fact, if you look at the, the countries that are up here, China, China is, is, has adopted a lot of market-based principles but it is not a it is not a democracy. It's a commun it's a communist country, controlled by the state, controlled by government. So very very different situation in China than in a lot of the rest of these places, USA, India, Japan, Germany. I'm not sure about Indonesia's form of government. Russia, you know, since the fall of the Soviet Union. They become more and more open to capitalist tendencies, but they're, yeah, I'm, I wouldn't say that they're a democracy yet, um, but certainly Brazil, United Kingdom, France, Mexico, most of the rest of the, most of those countries in the top 10 or 12 are de democracies. They're based on elections, their government officials are elected by the people in some form or fashion. And their, their methods and means for producing goods and services are essentially capitalist. So it wouldn't take much to make the argument that, I mean, you could argue either way here, but you know, China is so big, maybe because of government control, maybe because they have the most population of any country in the world. Could be they've got all the resources that they need to. You know, I don't know. It's very they they hold on to that information pretty closely. Cheap, yeah, cheap labor. Cheap labor, right? And and that's been highly controversial. Uh, there's a lot of American companies that that produce things in China. And, and, you know, sometimes they'll, those relationships generate protests. I mean, it's been overshadowed by a lot of the, the social issues we've had to deal with this past year, but that's still out there. So I, let me find the next one here.
the next thing I'm going to show you here, we have not had time to, to do this through most of the course of the term. And I'll make sure that I think I have this linked in the materials that you guys have already, but I will make sure that it gets it. it I'll double check that to get it linked if it's not already. You know, there's there's been kind of an ongoing assignment with some things about the Great Depression. And and this particular video um, was done a few years ago with people from Atlanta area um, that are involved with a, a museum down there that has tracked a lot of this stuff. And they brought in people to talk about their experiences of living through the Great Depression. Um, you know, the depression basically started in October of 1929 with the stock market crashed and ended around 1940 with World War II. So the entire decade of the 1930s was hard times in America. Uh, both my parents, they're both gone now. They were both born in the 30s. So they, they were depression era kids. And so that that has had an effect. And so maybe some of your parents or grandparents were born during those times. So you might want to ask him about some of their experiences here because some of it was pretty grim. spoke these simple and inspiring words in 1933, Americans from coast to coast, weary from years of economic hardship, were willing to take the freshly minted president at his word. He offered them hope, which was all that many people had left. The economic hardships brought on by the Great Depression had reached a pinnacle by the spring of 1933. On March 4th, an unprecedented event had occurred. Each and every bank had closed its doors. For some, this measure was only temporary, but for a large number, the economic crisis was a permanent reality. The banking system was near collapse. A quarter of the labor force was unemployed and prices and production were down by a third from their 1929 levels. During his first inaugural speech, President Roosevelt looked over the tense crowd in front of the Capitol, anxiously gathered before him, and with unquestionable conviction stated, this nation asks for action and action now. My father was a cotton mill worker, and so we moved a lot. By the time I was 21 years old, I had moved 24 times. But we, you know, we didn't have a big house back then, and we didn't have uh, carpet or anything like that. We had uh, linoleum floor, uh, wooden floors with linoleum rugs down on top of the air. Because uh, some of the places we lived, we'd see the ground too full. Uh, we ran a country grocery store. We ran a grid spell and a cotton gym in the south. Cotton was the king, and you couldn't get anything for the cotton. And then the government came along and had us take and uh, cut out the cotton production. Back in the Depression, uh, we saw a lot of people come from southeast Kentucky and eastern Tennessee. 
because they want to get better jobs there and nothing going in the coal mines. And so we had a lot of people come in that uh, were in bad shape. And they also went across the river to Cincinnati and there were almost uh, little enclaves of um, those people hoping they'd get someday up to the coast. <laughs> People found ways to get money, to do a job, to get employment, to keep the family going. In the first 100 days of the new administration, 15 measures flowed from the White House to Congress. 15 new laws assured absolute government action to employ the jobless, to improve the Tennessee Valley, to support crop prices, to prevent home foreclosures, to ensure bank deposits, and to stabilize the economy. Franklin D. Roosevelt called these programs a new deal for the nation. My mother got a job with the WPA, one of the UCL agencies. She worked in the public library, and I think she really enjoyed that job. She talked about it a lot, and it's the only job that she ever had in her entire life. Later on, after she married, she did not work outside the home, and um, but she talked a lot. And she would take us to the library as small children. She would tell us about her experiences working for the WPA in the public library. During the Depression, many people from Oklahoma and other states affected by the Dust Bowl moved to San Joaquin Valley looking for work. Some families were lucky and were able to get good jobs in Tehachapi, working in the cement plant in the Oregon State Prison. My parents bought a house on the edge of town and we had no gas or sewer line. I can still remember when the gas line was laid through the alley, the workers wrapping the material that looked like saran wrap around the pipes. The house next door was rented mostly by family from Oklahoma. One family built a small square shack behind the house using rolls of roofing material to cover the outside walls and migrant families would live in the shack for a while before moving somewhere else looking for work. Our house was close to the railroad tracks and I remember men knocking on our back door asking for water and something to eat. My mom would make them a bologna sandwich and white bread. Back then these men were not called homeless people but were called hobos or tramps that rode the train. A lot of people remember what things cost, but they don't remember what they need. And that makes a whole lot of difference. You know, you can buy a coat for a nickel or a uh, hamburger for a nickel. But trouble was, you didn't have a nickel uh, to buy them with lotion. And just things like that. So, you know, your memory clouds things a little bit. And uh, you tend to remember the good things. My husband, um, when he was a small boy, he was brought up in Walker County, Alabama. It is a coal mining district. And um, he was paid 10 cents a shot to go into the coal mines and to light the fuse on the blasting powder and then run like blazes to get out before the thing exploded. And men wouldn't do it, grown men wouldn't do it because they couldn't move fast enough. So they hired him because he was small and wiry and he just, he would get out of it before it blew up. Well, when his father found out about it, he whooped the tar out of him. <laughs> The president's first priority was relief for the millions of Americans who suddenly found themselves without work, without food, without shelter, and without hope. He concluded that help for the downtrodden must come from beyond the traditional private or local government sources. He believed that the federal government needed to take on a larger role in providing for the well-being of the American people. Of his many initiatives, the Works Progress Administration was the largest. It was created in the spring of 1935, and it further extended the national relief effort. The primary goal of the WPA was to alleviate the high unemployment rate and to provide assistance for the discouraged American workforce. The benefit from working for the WPA was that we were given fabric. And my mother has told me several times of the, a story of where they got the fabric. And it seems that the fabric was all one color and one design. 
for every nine years, you have that fabric that is the WPA type of part of their job, part of their type. My grandmother made dresses for all the girls, and my mother was really excited because that meant she had two dresses. And um, in this day and time, we don't think of that many, but uh, she was very excited about wearing the new dress to school. But when she got there, the other girls who had a little bit more money uh, kind of laughed at her because she had on WBA. But I laughed at her at her statement. She said, I didn't care. I had another dress. And said, that was the most important thing. Um, my uh, grandmother was a seamstress, and she worked all of her life all of her married life and um, she would send this ad out to uh, collect remnants from the clothing factories and so um, clothes was not a problem it was not an issue because my grandmother could make something out of nothing always she said however shoes they didn't have shoes because grandma couldn't make shoes <laughs> one of my aunts who was 85 shared so many stories with me. She said that she didn't feel that the depression had made that much of an impact on them because they were a family of nine children. So life was just always a struggle. And uh, she didn't really notice that much because uh, everybody in the neighborhood and all the other family members were working just as hard and struggling just as hard. One of <clears throat> There's a quite a bit more of this video that I'm not going to show right now. Any any impressions, and I would encourage you guys to watch the rest of that. This is really quite interesting. Any impressions from any of those stories or any of the photographs that you've seen so far? Of course, color photography was really not a, a thing back then. Nobody could, even, I'm not even sure it had even been invented yet. But these pictures that they're, go ahead. My grandpa talked about like when he was a kid, like gas was like 25 cents and stuff like that. And he was like, you mm -hmm. Was he born during the depression, your grandpa? Uh, he was in the 30s. Okay. Yep. Well, as I mean, I'm I'll be 64 at the end of this month. That gas was still that cheap in the 60s when I, you know, was a kid. So, uh, you know, inflation has had an effect, obviously, quite a bit. All these photographs that are used in here came from an initiative that the federal government started during the Great Depression. They actually hired photographers to go around the country and to take photographs of people struggling. Because if you're if you're thinking about being in Washington, DC, and you're a congressman, you know, you might know what it's like in your little part of the world back home, but you don't know how people are struggling in the rest of the country. So they they, they needed people to understand how bad things really were. And some very famous uh, photographers came came out through that process. A woman named a woman named Dorothea Lang has some of the most famous photographs from the Great Depression, and they provided those for the news media. They got them out in the public domain so that people could really see how people were struggling. And two things you heard a lot there already: the New Deal and the WPA, New Deal programs, kind of sounds a lot like what's been going on in the US here recently, trying to recover from the pandemic. A lot, lot of federal government programs. In the 30s, that was the first big expansion of federal government programs. You also, I want you to be sure you know who the WPA was. WPA stands for Works Progress Administration. Earlier in the video, they talked about improving the Tennessee Valley. Anybody ever been traveled to Tennessee, gone down there on vacation? 
your family's from down there, Brianna? You've been on any of those big Tennessee Valley TVA lakes? Okay. Those, the, the gigantic lakes that you see down in Tennessee and the, even extending into Kentucky, those were created by the Works Progress Administration with dams so that they could make hydroelectric power so that rural areas could get electricity. Because, you know, the hills of Tennessee, they're, they're not a whole lot of anything up on them hills. And so these, yeah. And certainly they didn't have electricity, you know? So that was a huge initiative of the federal government to get electricity to some of these areas that didn't have it before. So not only then do you create big lakes that can be used for drinking water and for recreation and for parks, then you can then you have these hydroelectric dams that can generate electricity and help some of these rural areas out. So the WPA was like the construction arm of the federal government. They built dams like that. They built libraries. There's libraries all over the country that were built in the 1930s. And it was a huge jobs program because if you're building infrastructure like that, roads, treatment plants, uh, you know, dams, reservoirs, all that kind of stuff, you had to have people to operate them. You had to have people to get out there and do that physical labor. So those are some hard times. I lost my. So going back to the the test prep sheet, and I'm kind of doing this a little bit out of order because the depression is listed on this sheet as number 22, and underneath that, two bullet points: causes and recovery. What were, what, were, what were some of the causes of the Great Depression? Well, anybody know? The first cause was the stock market crashed. That was in 1929. And then in that video, just a few years later, every bank in the country closed. So nobody had access to any money. Nobody had any money. People were out of work, struggling. Recovery, the New Deal programs were a huge part of recovery. But the big thing was World War II because what happened with factories in the US when World War II started? If you think back to that oil drum manufacturing cartoon that we looked at on the stock market, they converted all those factories over to wartime use, made airplanes, Jeeps, tanks, guns, all, all the, the stuff that the military would need to fight a war. That's what really brought us out of the Great Depression. We would have gotten there eventually with those New Deal programs, but the, the World War II kind of was a really a kickstart. Any got questions or comments so far? Uh, 22 or 23, something like that. Brianna just asked how many questions are on the test. So number three on the hit parade here is functions of money. If you've done that uh, functions of money handout, you'll know what these three things ABC refer to. So it's important to know how money gets to be used as money. Well, it's because it meets certain tests. It can, it can be a medium of exchange. It can be a unit of account can also be a store of value. It needs to be all of those things in order to be useful as money.
What about opportunity cost? Anybody remember what opportunity cost refers to? You're going to get a chip. one of the assignments is to write a story. You know, what's what's your American dream? And there's a follow up question that says, what is your opportunity cost going to be to make that dream become a reality? If you want something, you have to do something, and you're going to probably have to give up some things. And, and and the value of what you give up, that's your opportunity cost. You know, if you've got a bunch of equal uh, alternatives that you're considering, once you make a choice, those other alternatives then become your your opportunity cost. You can't do everything. You should know about the banking system, fractional reserve banking, bank services you might need. And before we go on to the next segment here, there's another little video clip I want to show you about banking. Now this, this next clip is from a movie, very famous movie called It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, a lot of times it's shown around Christmas time. And there's a very famous scene that was repeated over and over and over again in American society in the late 20s and early 1930s, something called a bank run. Don't look now, but there's something funny going on over there at the bank, George. I've never really seen one, but that's got all the earmarks of being a run. Now, uh, just remember that this thing isn't as black as it appears. I have some news for you, folks. I was just talking to old man Potter, and he's guaranteed cash payments to the bank. The bank's going to reopen next week. But, George, I got my money here. Did he guarantee this place? Well, no, Charlie. I didn't even ask him. We don't need Potter over here. I'll take mine now. No, but you're, 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 you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in the safe. The, the money's not here. Well, your money's in Joe's house. That's right next to yours. And in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and a hundred others. You're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do? Foreclose on them? I got two hundred and forty-two dollars in here, and two hundred and forty-two dollars isn't going to break anybody. Okay, Tom. All right. Here you are. You sign this. You get your money in sixty days. For sixty days? Well, that's what you agreed to when you bought your shares. Tom, Tom, did you get your money? No. Well, I did. Old man Potter will pay fifty cents on the dollar for every share you've got. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, what do you say? No, oh, Tom, you have to stick to your original agreement. Now give us sixty days on this. Okay, thing. Randall. Are you going to Potter? Better to get half than nothing. Well, Randall, wait a minute. Now listen. Now listen to me. I, I beg of you not to do this thing. If Potter gets a hold of this building alone, there'll never be another decent house built in this town. He's already got charge of the bank, he's got the bus line, he's got the department stores, and now he's after us. Why? Well, it's very simple, because we're cutting in on his business, that's why. Because he wants to keep you living in his slums and paying the kind of rent he decides. Joe, you had one of those Potter houses, didn't you? Well, have you forgotten? Have you forgotten what he charged you for that broken down shack? Here, Ed, you know, you remember last year when things weren't going so well, you couldn't make your payments? Well, you didn't lose your house, did you? Do you think Potter would have let you keep it? 
Can't you understand what's happening here? Don't you see what's happening? Potter isn't selling, Potter's buying. And why? Because we're panicky and he's not. That's why. He's picking up some bargains. Now, we, we can get through this thing, all right? We've, we've got to stick together, though. We've got to have faith in each other. Well, my husband hasn't worked in over a year, and I need money. How am I going to live until the bank opens? I got lots of bills to pay. I need cash. I, I can't keep my kids on faith. I've got to have How them. much do you need? Hey! I got $2,000. Here's $2,000. This will tie us over to the bank. Reopens. All right, Tom, how much do you need? $242. Oh, Tom, just enough to tie you over to the bank. I'll take $242. There you are. That'll close my account. Your account's still here. That's a loan. Okay. All right, yes. Well, I got $300 here, George. All right, now, yes. What will it take you until the bank opens? What do you mean? Well, I suppose $20. $20, bill. Now you're talking. Thanks, Ed. That's fine. All right, now, Mrs. Thompson, how much do you want? But it's your own money, now, George. Now, fine about that. How much do you want? Well, I can get along with $20, all right. Oh, and I'll sign the paper. You don't have to sign anything. I know. You just pay when you can. That's okay. All right, Miss Davis. Could I have seventeen fifty? That's your heart. Of course, you can have. You got fifty cents. Seven. We're gonna make it, George. Say, it'll never close us up today. Five, four, three, two, one. Bingo! <laughs> we made it. Come on, are you? Since we made it, look, look, we're still in business. We still got two bucks left. Well, look, let's have some of that. Let's celebrate. Special K knows only real bank runs. The reason I like to show that video is because it, it relates directly to the idea of fractional reserve banking and ties to the New Deal programs. When you, if you heard the narrator in that other video talk about uh, the federal government being involved in, in insuring deposits. That's what that refers to. That little building and loan that Jimmy Stewart was trying to manage there, they loaned out all of their reserves basically so people could build houses and, and do things. That's very common practice. The problem with the banking system back then was there was no strong Federal Reserve Bank that could step in and help banks when they got in trouble. There was no deposit insurance corporation like the F. If you see, you go into any bank now, it'll say somewhere pretty prominently displayed deposits insured by FDIC. Well, that stands for Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, there's a different one. I think it's NCUA for credit unions. So up to a certain amount, if the bank goes under, the insurance companies are going to step in and make sure you don't lose your deposits. That protection for consumers was not there in the 1930s. So all that stuff relates to fractional reserve banking and the, some of the fallout from uh, the years of the Great Depression. Anybody else have any thoughts after seeing that that video? All right, now the next, let me see here, from seven down to 13. Those are all terms. We've defined them. Uh, if you've done the terminology assignment where you got you get to write a little story, I mean, it's suggested to write a love story using these economic terms, but you can write any kind of story. Uh, if, if, if you want to, make sure that you understand how to use these terms correctly. Supply and demand, equilibrium, shortage, and surplus. Those are all connected. Think about your supply and demand graphs, the law of supply, the law of demand. What do these graphs look like? You know, which one, which line goes which direction? Make sure you get, get up to speed on all of that. Equilibrium. Got to know what equilibrium is. It's connected to all of this. How do you end up with a shortage? If you're a manufacturer and you're producing some products, 
you don't really want to have a shortage, but it could happen. How could you end up having a shortage of product? You, so are you, Sarah, are you saying that you maybe price your product too low? Yeah, it depends on the market. If the price is going low, so that you don't have the product. Okay. And if the price is too low, lots more people are going to go buy it. So you could end up with a shortage because not only did you price it wrong, but you underestimated the demand. The demand was higher than you thought it was going to be. So it, again, the reason I'm asking that question is because as you're thinking about the laws of supply and demand, you have to think about price also. They're all three connected. They all go together. High supply, low demand usually means low price. Low supply, high demand usually means higher price. That's why Ferraris cost so much. Low supply, very few of those made. Lots of people would want to have a Ferrari, but very few can actually afford it. Questions, anybody? And this, this test prep sheet here is really kind of a, an outline guide for you to, you know, these are all the topics that we've, that we've covered these first four weeks. Go back through the assignments, go back through the reading materials, go back through your notes, make sure that you, you've got something that you can refer to on all these various topics. Why would we have wants and needs on this list? Well, keep in mind, one of the basic theories of economics is we all have unlimited wants, but we don't have unlimited resources. So we have to make choices. If you go down there to 17, that's what the idea of scarcity comes from. Our resources are scarce. We have to make choices. Remember, economics is not necessarily about money. It's about choice. We got to make choices because our, our resources are limited. And so which of our wants or needs are we going to try to satisfy? You know, I, I think I used the example before of, you know, I, I, I want maybe a pair of LeBron James's latest tennis shoes, but I just need some shoes. So I don't need to spend whatever they cost um, just because it's like a status symbol of some sort. Just need some shoes. My resources are limited. If I had unlimited resources, if I had tons of money, yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. The wants and needs and scarcity all fit together. Those all three go together. Be sure you know who deals with these policy issues that follow there in number 15. What parts of our government are involved in those two things, monetary policy and fiscal policy, because it's not the same people. Anybody remember who deals with monetary policy? The supply of money? What? Yeah, the government, yes, but specifically, what group within government? The treasury. Uh, treasury is a part of that, but they're not the ones making the policy.
If I said it was the Fed, would that ring a bell? Yeah. And in this case, the, the Fed is not the federal government. It's the Federal Reserve Bank. There's an assignment on that too. They, they deal with the supply of money. They deal with uh, cash. Cash is king, of course, but that's their job. Fiscal policy is Congress job and the president's fiscal policy is about taxation and how tax money is is generated and how it's used Two completely separate entities. The Federal Reserve Bank is over the monetary policy and Congress and the president are over fiscal policy. Make sure you know the difference between those two. I think 16 and 18, uh, I need to rearrange those. Those are those are connected. You can probably understand those without a lot of explanation, deflation and inflation. 19 and 20 go together, really would be part of fiscal policy. What are the sources of government operating funds? Where do they get most of the money to, to fund these programs? Tax dollars. Tax dollars, yeah, it comes out of income taxes or other or other specific, uh, specialized taxing sources. Then what do they do with it? And keep in mind also that the taxation that they raise is not enough to cover all the costs. So the, the second big piece of where government gets money, especially in the US, is from borrowing. They're getting loans to pay for those other costs. Those are the two primary sources, taxation, mainly income taxes from you and I as private citizens, and then loans that the federal government has to get to complete the, the budgeting process. There is a graph a supply and demand graph that's included in the test. You'll have to know how to interpret it, identifying the equilibrium point. Um, also got some questions in there about the stock market and how you know if you make money or not. Sarah was just asking me about, about those before class started. We've got an assignment on that where you're gonna actually have to do those calculations to figure out if you've made money on your stock purchases and sales or not. Everybody wants to make money, nobody wants to lose money, but it does happen. Your money is at risk in the stock market. And then the last piece of this, this whole first four weeks connects back to uh, business and competition and how, the, how your business structure is going to determine uh, your risk. You know, how much liability can you, can you handle? Um, you know, it's, and it's, it, it would be scaled. The most risk is the sole proprietorship. Which, which one of these other forms has the least amount of personal risk? It's the corporation. Corporations get sued all the time. But the employees, the president, the CEO, they don't suffer as a result of those lawsuits. Corporation might have to pay some settlements or their insurance companies might, but that CEO is not gonna have his house seized because he got a judgment against the company. If you're a sole proprietor and you're found to be liable, all of your assets are at risk. So use this as a guide. The test will probably get posted tomorrow. And I'll make sure that those other videos get linked. If I don't have them in there already, I'll, I'll put them in a, uh, an announcement of some sort. Make sure that you have access to them. Anybody have any questions? No. 
All right. Well, uh, if you've noticed, you if you've got overdue assignments, I've started putting zeros into those in the grade book if they're more than two weeks overdue. Um, that's to get your attention. Two weeks is plenty of time to get these assignments done. So you can still do them. I'm not deducting points, but I am uh, going through the process to reflect your ac a more accurate grade by putting a zero in for work that you have not done yet. So please check that out in your classwork and make sure you get these things completed and turned in. So if nobody has anything else, we'll go ahead and end the class and we'll see everybody on Tuesday and we'll start the second half of class with some personal financial stuff that hopefully you'll find interesting. So thanks everybody for coming today. I appreciate it.